go to chapter 2. Now, as we dealt with chapter 1, and of course, we the very first part of chapter 2, if you'll remember again that Paul is addressing folks who are very familiar with the Old Testament, that is, to these Jews that have been scattered abroad, the majority of them are believers, but just like we mentioned last week, there is, like the wheat and the tares, no doubt there are some in this group who have a head knowledge. They fully understand that the Old Testament uh, was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. They know much about it. They might even accept the fact that he died, that he rose again, but there's warnings through this book to make sure that they don't stop short of receiving what they know in their head. That is, to not let those things get away from them that they might not move into that position of truly knowing the Lord. Now, as he is presenting this case, you know that even though uh, some of these people had accepted the fact that Jesus was the Son of God, some of them had no problem with it. They understood it just like the disciples. But then there were some who had heard different things that Paul had taught and different things about Jesus. They had erroneously been taught that perhaps Jesus had done away with the law that he had done away with the Old Testament. And in reality, what he did is fulfill the Old Testament. Uh, by no means that he relinquished his authority. It just, we moved to a new covenant, a new uh, fulfilling dispensation in the New Testament. So Paul is laying out this argument, and of course he starts out saying, you know, God dealt with the prophets, but now he has given us this revelation by his son. And he gives this argument about the angels. Now, we, of course, may not view angels like a Jew did, but a Jew looked at the law as having been given by the, uh, with the authority of a divine uh, angel to come down. They looked back and they said, boy, if an angel showed up and told you something, that really meant something. Well, in reality, the Word of God is greater than if I had an angelic visitor to tell me something. In fact, now I would reject it because Paul said, though an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, don't listen, listen to what God says. But even if I had a, a vision from an angel, it's not as sure and as steadfast as this book. However, a Jew in his thinking, not seeing the completed New Testament, still thinking in an Old Testament realm, they put a high emphasis on angels. And no, uh, as we remember, Jesus was even, uh, when the writer introduces his birth, he makes note of the fact that his birth was announced by an angel. But now he's laid out this case that the Lord Jesus Christ is better than the Old Testament prophet, better than the angels, and he says that we ought to give more heed to the Lord Jesus Christ, far more, and to those that heard him than we do to angels. Well, he continues that argument. If you look down in verse 5, he says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. Now, he is going to lay out a case, of course, as he begins this, by tying it into what he said, that, that Christ is better than the angels, which almost in our thinking goes without saying. But he uses that as a, an illustration to demonstrate just in what way Christ is so far greater than merely a heavenly visitor. You know, you still have people today, and of course it would be uh, what we would call damnable heresy, to believe that Jesus is simply a very important heavenly creature sent from God. He is not merely God's right-hand man, as some religions believe. He is not merely a divine appointed person that has been around for, for almost all eternity, but not quite as long as God, who maybe is like second in line next to God, who came down to this earth that God sent. That's not even enough. He is the Son of God. He is co-equal with the Father. And no doubt the believing Jews here understood that, but to those who were still viewing him the wrong way. He says, you think that the angels are great. He says, well, now what angel did God ever promise to put the world, the inhabited earth, in subjection to an angel? I mean, think back in your mind, he says to these that know the Old Testament, what angel did God ever promise a kingdom to on this inhabited earth? I mean, we don't look to say, boy, there's going to be a great throne and an angel is going to come down and take that throne. They believed the son of David was going to come take that throne. And he's making the case clearly that that son of David is the son of God. So what uh, 
hath he put in subjection the world to come? Well, of course not. So the first thing he deals with here is Christ's dominion. Now, that proves who he is because of the dominion that God has given him. Now, it's difficult sometimes when you think about this because, again, it's the Trinity. But when we think about God giving Jesus dominion, we think of it in the sense of his earthly name. That is, he did become a man. He placed himself in the place of doing the will of the Father. That by no means did away with his deity, but the earthly Christ who came here became Jesus, the Savior, and he's emphasizing that aspect that that man, Christ Jesus, who walked this earth, is not only just uh, just is he God, but he is a man whom God has given all dominion. Now notice in verse uh, 6, he says, In one certain place testified, saying, of course this is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 8, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Now we read that Psalm in Psalm 8, and of course, you know, as you read that, you, you get the impression that he's solely talking about man himself, because that is a great question. What is man? that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him. You know, have you ever had that question? Why did God even bother with us? Why are we so important to him? We're simply, do you know how difficult it would be for God to just wipe us out and start over? I mean, as far as from a practical standpoint, if God didn't need me. You'd say, oh, but if he did that, uh, you know, maybe somebody doesn't like it. Well, who, who's going to, God doesn't answer to anybody. I mean, what is man that he would even give us a thought? And yet, we see that it goes a little deeper than just man. Do you know what it is about man that is impressive? And, and I say this very carefully. What is it about man that's impressive to God? There's only one thing. Jesus became a man. You know, when Noah came off the ark, God had already looked at man and said, every imagination of his heart is only evil continually. He said, I gave him an opportunity to live by his conscience. I put some laws in his heart, let him live by that way. And you know what happened? If you left man without the influence of God and simply let him just to himself, he would die of his own rot. And eventually God said, there's just nothing worthwhile saving here. But Noah found grace in his eyes. He put him in an ark, and that's the only human beings that were left. So when Noah came off that ark, and God said, okay, we're going to start over here, you know what conclusion he drew? Man is evil from his youth. If I let Noah just have at it, his family will do the same thing. We'll be right back where we were before. But Noah, by uh, revelation, I don't know if his parents taught him. I don't know if how God let him know about it. But when he came off that ark, he built an altar. Now, on that altar, he didn't bring the work of his own hands. He didn't have any. That ark, he didn't take the ark and offer that as a sacrifice. He took one of those clean animals, and he shed blood, and God smelled a sweet savor. Now, obviously, that didn't mean that God likes the smell of cooking sheep. That sweet savor was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, the human race has no sweet savor. We're sinners separated from God, but the man, Christ Jesus, became one of us apart from sin. You know, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him? Well, I, I, I could wonder why God even bothered to come and be one of us, but I do have an answer to the question now. Jesus became a man, and that makes us significant when we become united to him so he says thou made him in verse 7 a little lower than the angels thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the work of thy hands now certainly as I read Psalm 8 I'm reading that and I don't understand necessarily it's prophetic as I read that I think well yes God gave Adam the dominion over the animals and he reminded uh, Noah of the same thing to go and to subdue the earth and so forth Man was given dominion over this earth. But let me tell you what he did. He lost it. He lost dominion over this earth. Now, the devil has never been given dominion over the earth. The devil is the prince of the power of the air. He does have dominion over 
the world system that we live in, but the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Man was given that dominion. Man really never, uh, by, by the fall, uh, we still are the highest creature as far as that's concerned, but by the fall, he gave up that right. But the Lord Jesus Christ came in and reclaimed it. You know, just turn a page over in your Bible. Just hold your spot there in Hebrews and look at Colossians in chapter 1, just a few pages back. In Colossians chapter 1 in verse 15, speaking of our Lord Jesus, he says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now that's significant because there was other creatures around, but he is the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. Now notice, by him. He is the creator God. By him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now that tells me Jesus is significant when it comes to every single thing that is created, for he not only created it, it was by him and for him. And even right now, he upholds all things by the word of his power. Turn back over to Ephesians. Go to the uh, first chapter of Ephesians. A few more pages over to the left. Now, when you get to Ephesians chapter 1, God, and this, you could read many verses here, but for instance, he says in verse 18, that your uh, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, what is the exceed, exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now get it. Set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Now, I won't keep turning you to passages, but I'll remind you of Philippians chapter 2. You're familiar with this one. God has also highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. Now, he's going to continue with that thought, but the fact is God gave him dominion. He is above all things. Now, what angel did God ever offer that to? He's far above any angel. So I notice his dominion. Well, then he turns and tells us a little bit about his death. Now, I'll grant you, this passage, in fact, the whole passage here, it is a deep passage. It is, it is familiar to us, and yet it's profound as you, as you see him explain this. And, and, and it takes more than a surface reading to grasp this, and there's more to it than I'll expound to you. Well, there's some tremendous truths in this passage. Notice about his death in verse 9. It says, but we see Jesus. Now, every time I notice the name of Jesus in the Bible, I like to take note of how God expresses his name. Because there are no wasted words in the Bible. I mean, it just Paul didn't just decide, well, today I'll call him Jesus, and when I write to the Colossians, I'll call him the Lord Jesus, and when I write to somebody else, I'll say Christ. Um, he said Jesus. He didn't decide that. The Holy Ghost did. That is his earthly name. That is his name, Savior, Joshua. He's speaking to these Jews, and he says, we see Jesus. Now, to us, we're, you know, I probably more often than not, I refer to him as the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the whole title. But he emphasizes this. He is the Savior. We see the Savior who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Now, he uses that phrase a couple of times, and I think of that. We've just talked about his dominion, who he was, and now he has been placed a little lower for a time. For a short time, he was a little lower than the angels even. Now, because he chose to place himself there, that is, he, uh, for the suffering of death before he was exalted. So we see him made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man now his death first of all was vicarious Jesus tasted death for every man if Christ
had not died. And again, he uses his earthly name because it's significant, the Savior, to Joshua, to, to the Jew, the captain of our salvation. Jesus now tastes death for every man. I mean, he died for our sin. We understand that. But what is the consequences of sin? It's death. The wages of sin is death. How could Jesus say to Martha, uh, Martha, you know, your Lazarus shall rise again. Well, I, I know, Lord, he's going to rise again at the resurrection of the last day. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now, that wasn't just merely a divine uh, fiat that God made. He tasted death for every man in my place. Now, what would that really mean? I've often said in preaching and evangelistic sermons that God took every bit of hell that I deserved, all the punishment that every human being, every sinner deserved, and bore the penalty for that. And basically, here it is. He tasted death. Now, we, we think of death, okay, well, he died on the cross. But he did far more than just die on the cross. How do you taste death for every man? He bore every part of the aspect of death. Death is separation. Uh, at, at least, it may be more than this, but it's at least God, him having to say to the Father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, that's what a sinner will cry forever in hell. They've been forsaken. They've, they're separated. They have no fellowship with God. And now the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, separated from God for me. And that'd be bad enough, but what about for every man? Now, he tasted death for every man. Does that mean that every man will not die? No, there's some that are going to be separated from God. You know, there was an insurmountable obstacle to keep man from ever being in fellowship with God. It's an awful obstacle, but very simple. It's our sin. God did not take away the penalty of death for every man, but he tasted death for every man. He made man savable. He removed an insurmountable obstacle. Uh, not all men will benefit from that because they choose to reject it. He made it so if a person would follow the light that God gave him, more light would be given and when he received that gospel light, provision had been made for his salvation for every man. It reminds me of that statement in 1 John 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. Thank God for my sin, but not for mine only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Unfortunately, he's, uh, his, his, he tasted death for every man, made it possible for every man, and yet man in his foolish state still rejects the gospel. Now, he... Yeah, did it vicariously, but then notice he says in verse 10, keeping the same idea of Jesus, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, just like we just emphasized, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now Jesus suffered on the cross. How would we say that Jesus became perfect through suffering? Does that imply that Jesus was not already perfect? Well, you know, many times we think of the word perfect in a moral sense. If we look at something that's perfect, the idea that we use is it's without a flaw. If it's perfect, it has no flaws. Well, now, Jesus didn't have any flaws. But perfect, really, in the idea here is complete. It's not that Jesus was incomplete, but he came to do the will of the Father. What was the Father's will? that he would come and give his life as a sacrifice. His sufferings, if you could look at it this way, completed his mission. He didn't become perfect in that he had a flaw, but it made it complete. It wasn't that when he got here on earth, he realized, oh, no, I didn't know what I was getting into. This was planned before the foundation of the world, and he wanted to bring many sons to glory. Now, he's beginning to build here. And again, I understand this is, takes some meditation. What we're just touching on tonight just give you uh, food for thought but to think that Jesus died now to bring many sons to glory you know I'm glad his name is going to be exalted wouldn't it be wonderful if he just came he, he suffered and he died okay this is temporal the earth is temporary there's going to be a kingdom 
His name will be exalted. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And we just get to get there. I mean, we just get to be, you know, we get to be on this side of the line when, when everybody bows the knee. We're bowing to our Savior. The others are bowing to their judge. And we just kind of get to go along for the ride. That would have been a great grace of God. But he wanted to bring many sons, that is, those who receive him, to glory. We become partakers. We live and reign with Christ in that kingdom. And even beyond that, to be joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now, God, again, is doing this, not because of man that I'm so wonderful, but really what God does, he does for his glory. I mean, I'm sure that it's difficult for us in our human thinking to put together really what all it means in the economy of God that he's doing this for us. All we know is we should praise him for his goodness to us. We should thank God that we're part of it. We did not deserve it. In his grace, he is bringing many sons to glory. I mean, he's, he's really laying the case out here and, and, I, and I, you know, it's deep. I understand that. But he's showing us what a privilege we have. Look at verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one. Well, who is he that sanctifieth? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to take time to turn you there. Uh, John 17, 26, when Jesus prayed to the Father, he actually prayed. He said, Father, uh, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then a similar prayer. I sanctify them that they might be sanctified. I mean, Jesus is the one that sanctifies. Okay, I understand that. He sets us apart. That's what that means. He that sets us apart and they who have been set apart are all one. Now, doesn't it make more sense? If you and I were running this thing, I say it makes more sense. That's a facetious way of saying it because what God does makes a whole lot more sense than what we would do. But in quotes, it makes more sense to us if the person who did the setting apart, the saving, the, you know, I'm going to take these people and I'm going to make a church. You think, okay, they're over here, they're part of the church, but the sanctifier, the one who did it, he's in a removed position, obviously a higher position. God changes that thought. He sanctified us, and he is the sanctifier, and what do we become? The church, what is the church? His body. We're vitally united to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we're part of him. Now, we take that for granted. Oh, yeah, I'm saved now. Yeah, you know, look at me. I say I got saved. Look what I know. Look at him. He did the saving. He made us part of him. And he says we're sanctified and, and all one. For the which calls, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I mean, that ought to just, you, you sit there and you hear that, and something inside goes, why wouldn't he be ashamed to call me brother? I'm nothing like him. Now, I will say, I don't know that there's any place in the Bible that gives me the ability to call him brother. I call him Lord. He is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Uh, he says, if you keep my commandments, then are you my disciples, and you know, he gives me some great privilege, but he's not ashamed to call me kinfolk. I mean, that's a, that's a remarkable statement. He says, um, not only that, he gives us a declaration here uh, in verse 12. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. He's quoting an Old Testament passage. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. So he's declaring something here. He is declaring our identification with him. I'm identified with Christ. Now do not misunderstand me. By no means is God placing me on his level. Do not think for a moment that I have been deified by becoming a Christian. That's Mormon theology. You're God, the God makers. They think, well, we're all going to be gods one day. Uh, and, you know, used to Satan and his brother I think owned that they you know populated the earth and so forth and you do the same thing have your own planet that's uh, pretty good setup from what I understand no we're not going to be gods we are worshipers of God we're praisers of God 
we're bystanders to say, look what God has done. But in the midst of being in that position, God has put us in an exalted position. Now, I can assure you, we're not by any means being put on his level. That's not the point at all. But he said, I'm not ashamed to call them. They're part of my body. They're part there of my church, redeemed by the blood of Christ. And he declares this, that we're in this place. We're identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, what a blessing to be identified. You know, in a sense, and this is such a human illustration, I can look at it kind of like a family. You know, if I go over and I met a man and his wife, and he had a number of kids. Now, he may have a, a, a boy who's impressive. Maybe he gets good at sports, or maybe he's well-spoken, or perhaps he's highly intelligent. Um, you know, and I meet his son. He's 12, 14, 16, 18 years old, whatever it might be. And perhaps I'd, I'd meet him, and I'd say, boy, he is a whole lot like his father. I mean, he, you know, he has really picked up whole, his uh, intelligence, good looks, athletic ability, um, just all around outstanding. People say this to my son all the time. They picked it up for me. No, I'm just kidding. No. Uh, let's just say he, you look at that son and you say, man, he really got a lot of stuff from his father. But I'm more impressed with the father. I'm more impressed that the son has some qualities that his father has. Now, I'm impressed with the son that he's picked them up. You understand there is a superiority to the father than to the child. But I'm highly impressed that the child looks like the father. But again, there's an exalted position of the father. Now, again, that's a human illustration. We are identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. But if an innocent bystander came along and looked at me, they would be far more impressed with Jesus that he had given me that ability to be identified with him. He's in the exalted position. But what a privilege to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm like a hell-bound, lost zero with the ring rubbed out. And through the blood of Jesus, I'm identified with a holy and a righteous, sovereign God through his death and, of course, his resurrection. Now, just real quickly, we'll try to move through this. Look at his deliverance as is given to us in verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, that would be us, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now the devil, we started off talking about he tasted death for every man. The devil does not, he can't kill me if God didn't want him to kill me. He, he is not the author of life. You think that the author of life would be God and he's the author of death. He had the power of death in that the devil is the murderer from the beginning. He institutes, he has a death culture. God's the author of life. There is one lawgiver, James chapter 4, who is able to save and to destroy. He has the ability to do both. But the devil is the institutor of what? What brings death? Who brought sin in? God certainly wasn't the author of sin. He is totally apart from sin. But God... And you say, well, how did he allow the devil to do that? Why did he create him to begin with and allow him to fall? It wasn't like he was fooled when the devil tried to rebel. That's God's plan. Whatever God had planned, we know it was right. But he brought sin into the universe. I will exalt myself above the throne of God. Chronologically, that's the first sin in the Bible. I will exalt my throne above God's throne. Now, I don't believe it even lasted long enough for him to finish the statement. As soon as that thought came, he was thrown down, and he was put down. He still, in a sense, exists. That is, he still operates. How many of you don't believe the devil still operates? Amen? I mean, he's, we know Revelation chapter 20, when he finally gets cast into the lake of fire for all eternity, he still operates, but through death, Jesus dealt a devastating blow. And it was one blow. And it wasn't a fight. It wasn't any competition. But when he dealt it, it was a knockout blow. Through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. You know, you ever have any problem with the devil? You claim that verse. He's a defeated foe. Do you remember when they accused Jesus of casting out devils by the power of the devil? He said, who can enter into a strong man's house except he first 
bind the strong man. Now, what was Jesus saying? You know why I can cast out the devil? Because I've bound the strong man. I'm Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You know, we give the devil far too much credit. Now, I'm not saying we don't know his uh, wiles. We, we're aware of his wiles. We know he's a roaring lion seeking whom we may devour. There are warnings in the Bible of being aware of him. But he gets far too much respect from us. He is a defeated foe. He has been dealt the death blow by the Lord Jesus Christ. His practical movement now is just a matter of time. You know, an Old Testament saint, how did they get saved? Jesus what, hadn't died yet because when God decreed it, all the forces of hell that could come up wasn't going to keep it from happening. That's why when he died, it was impossible that death should hold him. It was a done deal. He, when G, an Old Testament saint could be saved because even though it was yet future from our standpoint, as far as God's stand, standpoint, it was a done deal. Well, you know, the devil right now is operating, but as far as God's concerned, he's in the lake of fire. He's a defeated foe. Through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Now, we're the beneficiary, beneficiaries as believers because he's had that dealt blow dealt to him. You know how he did it? He didn't defeat him as a uh, mighty heavenly creature. He took on him flesh and blood and defeated him. How did he defeat the one who had the power of death? Through death. He defeated him. And what a tremendous thought. We're out of time tonight, so we're going to stop there. And that's probably enough for you to chew on between now and next Wednesday night anyway. So we'll go ahead and stop there and have a word of prayer. Lord, how we thank you tonight for your word. And Lord, we could not search the depths of what the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. And Lord, even some of the statements that are made, we, we revel in them. We understand that they're, they're tremendous, powerful thoughts. And yet I'm confident until we stand before you and see you as you are, uh, we may not fully appreciate all that you've done. But would we praise you tonight, God, and give you the glory due unto your name? pray you would lead us now in the end of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. 344 is going to be our song tonight. We'll sing a stanza of 344 and we'll be dismissed.